Good morning. Okay, and it looks like we are live on YouTube. Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the December 17th, 2020 public meeting of the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. I will call the roll. Chair Carroll? Here. Commissioner Bland? Here. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Here. Commissioner Chapin? Here. Commissioner Chen? Yeah. Commissioner Devonshire? Here. Commissioner Goldblum? Here. Commissioner Gustafson? Here. Commissioner Jefferson? Here. Commissioner Lutfi? Here. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Here. Okay, all set. Good morning and welcome to our public meeting today. Today we have uh, five public meeting items to review. Our meeting is being held via Zoom and being live streamed on YouTube. These public meetings have all had public hearings where the commission listened to the presentation, listened to testimony and reviewed written testimony and uh, commented on the projects and asked applicants to make revisions and come back. And so these applicants are coming back today with revised proposals in response to those comments. So there is no additional public testimony. However, with public meeting items, we always welcome written comments on revised proposals that are submitted in advance of the public meeting day. So if we have received anything, we will note that for the record. And um, with that, I will turn it over to the Director of Preservation, Corey Scott Harala, to lead us through our public meeting agenda. Okay, thank you, Sarah, and good morning, commissioners. We're going to start uh, this morning with item number one. This is LPC 21-00282, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 1960, lot 32, 405 Vanderbilt Avenue in the Clinton Hill Historic District. This is a Romanesque revival style carriage house built in 1890, and the application is to construct a rooftop addition. This was last presented at the public hearing of October 6, 2020, and no action was taken at that time. Uh, and the uh, staff will be presenting this item this morning. And staff, you may begin. Um, hi, good morning, commissioners. Dina Taswinter, preservation staff. Uh, the item before you is 405 Vanderbilt Avenue, a carriage house located between Green and Gates Avenues in the Clinton Hill Historic District. The application is to construct a rooftop addition. As Corey mentioned, it was originally brought forth at the October 6th public hearing at which no action was taken. So this shows the original proposal. At the hearing, there was a consensus among commissioners that conceptually a visible rooftop addition with a contemporary design is appropriate at the building. However, the majority of commissioners had concerns about certain aspects of the addition as proposed. Specifically, while it was acknowledged that any addition at this location will inevitably be visible, the commissioners requested that the design be restudied in order to set it back further from the front and side facades and or to reduce the overall scale and visibility. Several commissioners also asked that the applicants uh, retain the historic masonry chimneys that were present at the side facade of the carriage house and reconsider the finish of the addition. Some commissioners were amenable to the proposed metal siding but asked that a lighter color be explored. Uh, so in response, the applicants have proposed to reduce the height and volume of the addition, retain the three masonry chimneys at the north facade, raise the north parapet by only several courses of brick rather than to the full height as previously shown and to lighten the cladding finish color. The red, uh, oh, this plan shows that the addition will now be set back from the north parapet rather than resting on top of it and that the three chimneys will remain. Um, and here the red shading shows the extent to which the height of the addition has been reduced. The north parapet and the chimneys will collectively be increased in height by three widths of brick in order to mitigate the visibility of the metal siding over the secondary facade while retaining the historic chimneys and the chimney parapet relationship. Commissioners will note that the roof line is at the minimum angle that is allowed by code in order to avoid the necessary construction of a parapet at the front facade and also so that solar panels can be installed at the rear without an additional mounting structure. 
So this is the existing conditions, the previous proposal, and now the current proposal. And then uh, the view over the primary facade, existing, previous, proposed. Um, note that the window openings have also been slightly reduced here. And the proposed siding material is a silver zinc flat lock system that will patina over time. The applicants are here to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dana. Commissioners, do we have any questions? On this. Okay. Not seeing any questions. Rich, did we receive receive any written comments um, in res uh, response to the revised proposal? We received one letter from an individual in opposition. Okay. All right. Any final questions, commissioners, or would you like the applicant to address anything before we begin our discussion? Okay, Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. Just curious about the plan. Um, if you, you seem to have a courtyard, is it open to the sky or is it closed in? If you go to your section, um, drawing three and four, uh, so that's a courtyard. And is there a cutout in, in the roof plane? Um, yeah, there is. And if okay. you go to your section, in, in your section, all right, uh, sorry, uh, Commissioner Jefferson, if we can just open the meeting, yeah. open the proceedings. So I'm gonna- Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, Commissioner Chapin, okay. would you make a motion to open the proceedings? Make a motion to open the proceedings. Okay. And Commissioner Holford smith would you second that motion? I second the motion. Okay, all in favor, say aye. <coughs> aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, now the applicant may actually speak. Sorry about that. And please identify yourself for the record, please. Uh, it's Philip von Dalvik. I'm the architect for four or five vendor built. Um, to answer the question, yes, um, the patio is open um, to the exterior. Oh, so this, this section, the roof is, is not correct, right? I think. Beyond. The section shows the red only indicates the amount we reduced. It was oh, not okay. meant to indicate a roof line. Okay, thank you. Okay. Are there any final questions? Okay. All right, I think we'll begin our discussion. Um, and this, item um, we saw on in October, last October. And at that time, as Dina said, the commission conceptually, it was conceptually fine with the idea of a visible addition on this building, given the varied streetscape and roof lines. And, um, and, and while f some uh, had some questions about the geometry, others noted that the angles allowed for not only solar panels, but also the, to allowed them to avoid having to do a railing. And, and because it was next to angled pitched roofs and mansard roofs, I think most commissioners were fine with the geometry, but there was a strong suggestion to lower it, particularly at the front and um, preserve the chimneys on the side and rethink the finish. And they have um, <clears throat> made a move in all three of those areas. So let's have a discussion and see if they have successfully responded to our comments. Um, I think Commissioner Shamir Barron, I think you were one of the commissioners who was very comfortable with the geometry and just wanted to see some changes to the refine it a little. And how are you feeling now? Yes, um, I was very much in support of, of the approach here. Um, I, I think I wanted to see the chimneys, but would have been fine living without them. And I also happen to like the previous color but I understand that this will patina and change. So I'm very much in support of this and think it's absolutely appropriate. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Holt-Smith? Uh, yes, I agree. I think the uh, reduction in height and the change to the lighter finish is, is successful. And um, I think I applaud the keeping of the original chimneys, which I think is an important feature of this view. So I'm in, I'm in favor of this application. Uh, Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yes, uh, while the um, 
dark color in some ways is it might have been a nicer design statement. I, I think that this change of color is uh, much better in helping it to blend in. And as, uh, and also the lowering of the height. And I agree with keeping uh, the chimneys. And I think this is much more successful and I feel comfortable with it at this point. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. Yeah, I agree. The chimneys are, are an improvement. The angle, reduction of angle is, is very effective while still keeping the interest of the design. I agree with Adi that the black was better. Um, I think that the gray actually calls a little bit more attention to itself than the black does. And the black actually, I think, blends better with the building next door and the kind of darker color of the dormers. Uh, 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 so I would encourage them to go back to the black, but I think it's appropriate. <clears throat> Okay, Commissioner Devonshire. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. I, I think this is excellent. I, I think he's been very responsive. The, I, I actually think the Rhine zinc is a good choice. It's going to be less reflective than is actually shown in this rendering. And it eventually will turn a, a darker gray, almost like the slate on the mansard next door. I think that's an excellent choice for the cladding. Great, and Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I agree with the commissioners. Uh, this is appropriate. <laughs> Bland? I agree. Um, I think the Rhine zinc is a great choice too. I think it will age nicely and um, uh, and I like seeing the chimneys retained. Commissioner Lutfi? I agree. Um, I think the zinc is great. I think the proportions are better. I look forward to seeing <laughs> it. Um, age. Uh, I, I actually appreciate the, the, uh, the angles at the top a little more now because uh, it uh, seems a little more grounded within the uh, structure itself and the chimneys. Wonderful. Great. And Commissioner Jefferson. Um, my own, yeah. I, I think as an aside, I think your plan is beautiful uh, on the inside. Uh, in regards to our, my comments, the, 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 <laughs> um, the, the chimneys are wonderful. I think they work really well. And I agree with my fellow commissioners that I think the darker panel color will act more as a silhouette that would probably work better than, 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 than the gray. And the silhouette adds mystery to this. Uh, undulating ceiling plane, but I, I think it's, it's, it's a nice job. Very well done. Okay, and Commissioner Gustafson. Uh, appropriate as is. Okay, great. All right, thank you all. Um, I think that uh, this project um, has really um, resolved itself very nicely, and I appreciate the applicant's response to our comments, which I think have made all the <laughs> And um, while I think some people were open to a darker color, I, we do have enough votes for it as is. And I do think this as will patina as well. So I think we'll go ahead and make a motion. Um, Commissioner Shamir Barron, are you okay making this motion? Of Even course, yes. Great, thank yeah. you. In the matter of LPC 2100282405 Vanderbilt Avenue, Clinton Hill Historic District, Brooklyn, the Romanesque Revival style carriage house built in 1890, and the application is to construct a rooftop addition. I know that the building style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Clinton Hill Historic District, and I recommend approval, finding that the work will not damage or eliminate any significant architectural features of the building, that the addition will be set back from the primary and rear facades and will maintain a sense of the original volume of the carriage house, that the presence of a visible rooftop addition featuring a distinctive profile <coughs> will relate to the varied and eclectic roof tiles of the streetscape, that the simple punched openings at the Vanderbilt Avenue facade of the addition will be in keeping with the fenestration pattern at the lower floors of the building and are consistent with top floor window openings found along its, this streetscape. That the proposed zinc flat lock cladding system is compatible with the materiality of a carriage house below and will harmonize with the other visible rooftop finishes along the streetscape that raising the parapet at the visible north facade while retaining the three historic chimneys will not eliminate any significant features or overwhelm the existing facade, and that the proposed work will not detract from the architectural and historic character of the historic district. Thank you, and Commissioner Holford-Smith, would you second that motion? 
I second the motion. Thanks. And Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Commissioner Jefferson, you're muted. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay, with 11 in favor and unopposed, the motion carries. Okay, that's approved. Thank you very much. And we'll move to the next item. Next item is number two, LPC 21 04470. An application for an amendment in the Borough of Manhattan, Lot 1832, Lot 29, 361 Central Park West, the first Church of Christ Scientist in New York City, individual landmark. Proposed art classical style church designed by Career and Hastings and built in 1899 to 1903. The application is to amend the commission approval on 6 2020 under LPC 20 05782 to construct additions, replace windows, alter entrances, and replace doors, install signage, and excavate at the cellar to include revising the rooftop monitor. Commissioners, I'd like to note that in June of 2020, the commission approved a proposal for enlarging and modifying this roof monitor, along with other work to convert the building to a children's museum, but stipulated that the applicants explore with staff the feasibility of salvaging and reinstalling the copper cladding or replicating its profile up at the monitor. However, the applicant team has determined it infeasible to retain the historic copper work and will instead present a revision to the design of the new copper clad monitor after we open the proceedings. Okay, thank you. And the commissioner, let me just see, I've got to unmute everybody again. Commissioner Holford Smith, would you make a motion to open the proceedings? Motion to open the proceedings. All right, and Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All right, and all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the applicant may present. And please Good say morning. aye for the record. Oh, good morning, commissioners. Misha Hunter Burkett, Lee Saltzman Architects, um, and uh, very uh, pleased to be here today um, to present um, FX Collaborative's revised design. Um, and uh, just to be brief and following what Corey um, <coughs> introduced, um, the team did hear um, most sincerely the commissioner's comments um, and did carefully study um, any way to salvage and reuse the historic copper as much as possible in the new copper monitor edition. Unfortunately, we determined that we cannot do it. Um, the existing copper is just not salvageable and I'll show you that in some um, detailed photographs of the deterioration. Um, it's almost 120 years old and is severely deteriorated. Further, uh, the dimensions of the historic copper components um, do not work with the previously approved form that was uh, shown before the commission uh, in June of 2020. Um, what you'll see in this presentation is that FX Collaborative has um, improved and refined the details and the articulation of the new copper clad monitor edition from what was previously shown. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, this is a view of the existing condition uh, from uh, Central Park. Oh, can you go back, please? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this is a view uh, from Central Park West, uh, south of the site on uh, 96th Street um, and uh, looking northwest. Um, so this is the existing condition. Next, please. Okay, uh, this is the um, previously presented uh, design. And again, we're looking at the copper monitor edition that is uh, immediately to the left of the um, historic steeple. Um, can I see the next please? And this, oh, can I have the next please? For the currently proposed, oh, it jumped. Okay, 
Uh, for, oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, this is the currently proposed uh, design for the uh, copper monitor edition uh, that recalls the historic monitor, but in a contemporary vocabulary. Um, specifically in terms of its form, the proposed copper monitor edition sits within the footprint and matches the roof profile of the original monitor. Um, in terms of its materials, uh, the proposed copper monitor edition will be clad in perforated copper uh, to recall the original copper material. Uh, in terms of detailing, the FX collaborative team um, very carefully studied the historic monitor detailing and interpreted the details in a contemporary way. And in terms of light and shadow, uh, FX Collaborative um, refined um, the EVE profiles from what you previously saw uh, to closely match the original configurations and achieve a similar light and shadow pattern. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, LSA, Lease Altman Architects, has been performing conditions assessments um, of the building, the original First Church of Christ scientist uh, for 30 years uh, for a succession of owners. And we have witnessed firsthand the long-term effects of deterioration uh, with Band-Aid repairs uh, due to uh, financial constraints rather than addressing the underlying causes of deterioration. The original copper monitor actually featured a skylight that provided daylight to the fourth floor meeting room through three large ley lights. Unfortunately, uh, the original skylights were coated with tar and then the tar was painted over with green paint uh, to suggest the appearance of copper, which it is not. Over the years, the original copper has been painted and repainted and coated multiple times. It is almost 120 years old and at the end of its service life, it is simply not salvageable. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, so we've taken photos and tried to show um, conditions um, both of the exterior as well as the interior. Uh, on the lower right, for instance, you can see um, from the attic view looking up to the skylights um, and how the um, glazing was uh, coated with, with tar, but then from the exterior, you can see um, that the tar was then since coated with um, a green paint uh, to, to give the appearance of copper. Um, so uh, this is um, just showing some sampling photographs of deterioration over 30 years. Can I have the next slide, please? This is a bird's eye view um, that was prepared by FX Collaborative um, to show the current updated design. Um, it offers a close-up perspective, um, but uh, for the purposes of this discussion, but not suggesting the visibility from the street. I just want to make that very clear. Um, throughout this design process, FX Collaborative has consistently sought to engage in a meaningful dialogue between the historic fabric and the new design elements and allowing both historic fabric and contemporary interventions to read legibly. The proposed copper monitor edition, as said previously, is proposed to be clad in copper with rain screen wall panels and standing seam copper roofing. Um, the X-brace motif that you notice on the south elevation um, will be interpreted in a contemporary way. As part of the sustainability program for the new Children's Museum, FX Collaborative has included solar panels on the roof uh, and also skylights that will recall the original historic skylights, um, allowing natural light to enter the workshop and performance space below. Ultimately, the proposed copper monitor addition, as shown, will help to signal the building's adaptive use and its new chapter as a vibrant new children's museum for visitors and for the public at large. Um, next slide, please. These um, cross-section comparisons show the historic condition um, on the right and the currently proposed condition on the left. Um, the proposed copper monitor edition um, is based on careful study of the original um, and tries to recall as closely as possible the roof slope, the eave profile, depth and height, the base coping profile and dimension, as well as the copper cladding. Um, 
in response to um, necessary uh, DOB head clearances um, for the egresses on the east facade, uh, FX Collaborative um, increased the height of the proposed copper monitor addition by four inches uh, to provide that necessary head clearance. Um, measured at the eave, the new copper monitor addition is four foot three inches higher uh, than the original copper monitor. Can I have the next slide, please? So uh, on the left, you see the um, previously proposed design and on the right, the uh, currently proposed design. And again, these are um, bird's eye view um, elevation so that you, um, you know, would not perceive um, this view uh, from the street, but just trying to give um, clarity uh, to uh, the FX uh, collaborative uh, design vision. The current proposed design uh, does recall the original monitor while being appropriately scaled to the facade. And the current design uh, provides greater clarity and depth, framing and shadow lines and more definition, particularly at the X brace motif. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, you can see uh, in this uh, close up detail, both the previously proposed on the left, the current proposed on the right, um, and please again, bear in mind that this, this view is not what you would see from the street, um, particularly as you note the, um, the uh, terracotta rain screen um, that's in the skirt um, below the proposed copper monitor addition, um, you know, that, uh, that would be seen much more obliquely uh, from the street level. Uh, the proposed um, design, um, FX Collaborative did refine the copper monitor addition to create layered assemblies and refine the detailing of the eaves matching the original dimensions and contours. So again, the materials include the copper X brace motif and framing, um, perforated copper panels. So if you look at the X brace motif that runs as a horizontal band on the um, right uh, side of the slide, um, you can see that there are perforated copper panels below the X brace motif, and um, these are a little bit less perforated. Um, the uh, perforated panels behind the X brace motif are a little bit more open. Um, again, to recall um, historically that there were um, glass lights uh, behind the X brace motif in the historic design. Um, we also see um, flat seam copper copings and eaves. And then at the, um, almost to suggest piers, ribbed copper panels um, at the corners to provide that vertical definition. Uh, and then a standing seam copper at the roof. Can I have the next please? Uh, another detail um, with the previously proposed on the left, the current proposed on the right, um, shows again the revised design of the X brace motif framing and its depth um, to recall the original Clara story detailing. Again, you can see the um, perforated panels uh, below the X brace um, being a little bit um, less perforated and then the um, perforated panels behind the X brace motif uh, directly being a little bit more so, more open, more perforated. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, this plan shows the footprint of the proposed copper monitor addition in relation to the steeple on the right and the proposed mechanical bulkhead on the left. Uh, at the east elevation, so that is where you can see the circulation of stair um, that would allow access to the terrace, um, the FX collaborative team was able to achieve the minimum separation distances between uh, the two exits um, in, um, in conformance with DOB code uh, requirements. Uh, next slide, please. Um, FX um, studied the proportions um, very carefully and prepared um, this visual analysis of the existing monitor overlaid onto the east facade of the proposed monitor addition. And similar to the south elevation, raising the monitor roof uh, transforms the east and west gable ends uh, into facades. The scale and detailing of the former gable end uh, at the east uh, no longer works with the workshop performance space and stairs um, beyond. 
uh, FX studied the original composition uh, of the historic copper monitor and found an underlying rhythm between the end brackets and the center area with the segmented arch panels. The rhythm serves as the organizing element for the new east facade. Um, a strong horizontal datum that you can see um, between the uh, two egress points uh, recalls the raised base of the monitor and unites all four facades. Finally, the bracketed ends recall the original copper monitor condition. Uh, the openings maintain the overall symmetry and rhythm. And as we know, um, with this um, classical Beaux-Arts style building, that symmetry is so important. Can I have the next slide, please? The design was further refined to feature um, two inch wide, sorry, two foot wide panels that match the north and south elevations. Um, the stair openings that you can see at the south and the north um, that are adjacent to the end brackets meet the separation distance requirements as mandated, mandated by the Department of Buildings and reinforce the symmetry of the facade. Uh, we note that the eave profile does match the original copper monitor condition. Uh, the exit signs that you can see um, adjacent to both the um, egress openings uh, are laser cut into the um, copper panels. Um, there is a, a rectangular window below the ridge uh, to allow light into the stair. Uh, you can also see a copper clad channel reveal and ribbed copper panels uh, at the corners. Next slide, please. And this is just, uh, in sum, uh, we can see the existing condition, the previously proposed as shown in June, and the current proposed. Um, and uh, we believe that this uh, current design um, is appropriate um, and is, um, we present it to you today with, um, with great enthusiasm and we are available to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Misha. So just to be clear, the commission approved a project here in June of 2020 to um, make changes to accommodate the new use of the Children's Museum. And that included, among other things, raising the height of the monitor, sort of reconfiguring and raising the height of the monitor. So the volume um, that was approved has not changed. But as a, a condition of that approval, we asked that the applicants consider um, exploring the feasibility of salvaging the existing copper for reuse on the approved volume. Um, and they have uh, presented today the challenges with that. And um, in, in, in lieu of, of using salvaged copper, they are proposing to refine uh, the details and they have revised the details of the new uh, copper to um, be more evocative of the existing copper. So, um, so the change is really in the details of the new materials, not the volume. Are there any questions for Misha? Oh, I, I had one final point, Sarah. I forgot to mention that um, that my understanding is that the uh, there's a, a desire to work with the new exhibit designer at the museum um, in a way to salvage elements from the um, copper monitor and and integrate these um, as part of the exhibit for the new children's museum. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, any questions? Okay, and I think if we can just quickly go back to slide, I think it's slide five or six, it just shows the existing condition. I think you can see the amount of copper that um, that exists in its condition. And so what we were looking at are the, the crosses, some brackets, and these end panels. Um, much of this, as Misha has described, is very deteriorated and, and or altered. But um, I think other part of the technical issues is that the end panels um, cannot be incorporated into the addition with the doors in a sort of meaningful way and that there may not be enough of it to be meaningful as I think what was being presented today. So why don't we go back to the final renderings and we will um, begin our discussion. And before we do that, I just wanna 
check with Rich again to see if we received any written comments on this proposal. No written comments on this proposal. Okay. Okay, I am unmuting everyone so that we can begin our discussion. Um, Commissioner Bland, I believe you were here and supported the uh, proposal as it was presented last time and want to hear your thoughts on this. Well, still supporting it. Um, I think the changes are, of course, minimal. For a long presentation, there's not much uh, really that's changing. Um, uh, and we've already approved the, the change of, uh, uh, of the mass up on top. It's over, a little over four feet taller than the original. Uh, so I don't intend to uh, re-prosecute that a whole issue, but I would think that the careful proportions of this uh, wonderful building by Carrera and Hastings is not really altered in any way significantly. It is altered, but not significantly enough uh, that it <coughs> harms the, uh, the careful proportions that the building ha had originally. So uh, again, back to the just the change of materials, I'm, I'm very comfortable with this and I think it continues to be uh, an appropriate uh, adaptive reuse of this wonderful church building. Okay. <clears throat> Commissioner Lutfi. Um, <clears throat> I agree. Uh, I, I really, actually, I enjoyed hearing all the detail. <laughs> right. It really underscored um, how carefully the, the applicant has looked at this and just how refine some of these changes and I think they work very very nicely you know on the south elevation that cross tracing motif being more obvious is you know it's nice it adds to the layering I love the perforation both um, there and also on the uh, I think it's the is it the north elevation or the east elevation Anyway, I think I think it's great, and I support it. Commissioner Jefferson, uh, I support it. <laughs> Commissioner Gustafson, I agree. All right. Commissioner Shamir Barron, yes, I I was in support last time, and I think that these um, <laughs> minor changes uh, do not detract from that previous um, positive review. I think it's very appropriate. You. Commissioner Holford Smith. Yes, I agree. I think actually that the um, detailing has improved and it will uh, be a little more evocative of the original. Um, so I'm in, I'm in support of this. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yes, uh, I think in general that it is, uh, it's addressed this as in, in a, a very satisfactory way and I can approve it. Commissioner Goldblum. Well, um, I'm I'm less sanguine than, than others, perhaps. I can approve it. I think it's I think it's improved, but um, my view is that these are visible decorative elements that are original, and that we, I mean, we generally try to preserve those. Uh, we're allowing them to to modify the volume, which is a, itself a significant change. Uh, the Photographs did not convince me that 100% of it is unusable and their, their final comments about salvaging it indicates that some of it is salvageable. I'm, I'm less uh, optimistic about it, but I, I do think that it, it is appropriate as shown. I just think it's an unfortunate situation where original historic material and design elements are being uh, eliminated. Commissioner Devonshire. Um, I, I can support this, you know, in, in general, the, the copper has already exceeded its expected performance life by about 30 years. And, and the addition of the, the asphaltic material, which probably contains asbestos, and then the additional material on top, I think, kind of renders any of it unsalvageable or if it is salvageable, the cost of, of remediating the asbestos would be such that it would be prohibitive. So I, I can approve it as is. Commissioner Chen. Uh, the same here. I had to commend the applicant for a very, very thorough and detailed uh, presentation. Okay. 
and I think we've made it around. So I think we do have um, a, a consensus here of support, um, recognizing, of course, Commissioner Goldblum's concern about historic material, um, visible decorative historic material being lost. But I do think um, there are issues with being able to salvage it in a meaningful way, you know, rather than maybe just a piece here or there. And I think um, that the that the new material and the new details will be much more evocative so than was pre than what was previously presented so um commissioner lutfi would you read this motion yes i would and and i would just like to before i do um congratulate the uh children's museum they have been in search of a space for so long they found one they've worked so hard on this and i want to wish them the best of luck Yes. Um, okay. Uh, in the matter of docket 21-00, oh, sorry, dash 21-044703631 Central Park West First Church of Christ Scientist of New York City Individual Landmark, Beaux-Arts classical style church designed by Claire Hastings and built in 1899, 1903. The application is to amend the commission <clears throat> approval on 6-2020 under LPC 20-05782 to construct additions, replace windows, alter entrances and replace doors, install signage and ex excavate at the cellar to include revising the rooftop monitor. I note that the commission approved a proposal for enlarging and modifying the roof monitor along with other work to convert the building to a children's museum. It stipulated that the applicants explore with staff the feasibility of salvaging and reinstalling the copper cladding or replicating its profile. I recommend approval finding that the existing decorative copper work at the monitor is in poor condition that warrants replacement that the placement and proportions of the existing copper work do not readily adapt to the design and form of the raised rooftop monitor previously approved by the commission as part of the adaptive reuse of the building, particularly at the corners of the gable ends where new openings are being incorporated. That the details of the proposed new copper work more fully express the depth and articulation of the original copper elements than the previous proposal and as viewed from the street, will recall the original monitor and harmonize with the building. And that the proposed work will not diminish the special architectural or historic character of this individual landmark. All right, thank you. And Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. And Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. <laughs> Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay. 11 in favor, none opposed. The motion carries. That's approved. Thank you and good luck. And we'll move to the next item. Okay, the next item is number three. LPC 20-09935, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 404, lot 23. 538 East 11th Street, the free public baths of the city of New York, East 11th Street Bath, individual landmark. This is a neo-Italian Renaissance style building designed by Arnold W. Brunner and built in 1904 to 05. The application is to alter the facade. This was last presented at the public hearing of November 10th, 2020, no action was taken at that time. The staff will do a brief introduction. Good morning, commissioners. Brian Blazak, preservation staff. Uh, the subject property is 538 East 11th Street. As Corey said, on November 10th, 2020, the commissioners reviewed a proposal to remove and replace the existing gates and monumental openings, to remove the existing tiling and install wood cladding at the open vestibule to remove and replace the existing lanterns and to alter the front steps and install a handrail. Most commissioners express concerns that the proposed ironwork does not sufficiently recall 
the original elaborately designed ironwork at the transoms and felt that the proposal needed more articulation, depth, and revised profiles and solid to void ratios. No action was taken. As a result, the proposal has been modified to that feedback and the applicants are here to walk you through the updated proposal. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll have to open the proceedings so the applicants may present. Commissioner Gustafson, would you make a motion to open the proceedings? So moved. And Commissioner Lutfi, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the applicant may begin. And just state your name for the record. Please remember to unmute yourself. Thank you. Yes, hi. Good morning, Shay Murdoch. Murdoch Saloon Architects. Okay, please go ahead. Um, yes. Uh, I can't see the slides, hold on. Here we go. <clears throat> um, okay, the original uh, proposal from the 10th uh, is on the left and the revised proposal is on the right in this initial. And I'll just walk through uh, the, the changes that we made. Since, since we um, initially presented, we have reached out to and have been in collaboration with a local ironwork foundry who have um, extensive uh, restoration experience in many landmark buildings to better understand some of the period specific metal techniques that would have been used on the bathhouse itself and other uh, buildings of this period. A revised design incorporates many of these techniques. So the first change was to the Roman lattice was redesigned to better emulate the original window guards and has been moved above the spring line of the arch. instead of below in the transom as uh, our previous proposal. This is more in keeping with the original configuration. Uh, and we've also introduced a button head rivet at the intersection of the Roman lattice, which uses punch joinery, a metal work joinery technique used in the early 19th century and is evident in the original tax photos. The tripartite vertical divisions of the mullions have also been further emphasized by wider and stepped profile in the arches and transom above the gates as seen in the original tax photo. It, also in order to achieve a sense of depth, we are utilizing layered steel profiles to emulate the profiles of the original ironwork. Now, originally we had had just square profiles and we're now we're starting to have steps and reveals to better uh, create a sense of depth. Um, the gates below uh, have kept a similar proportion from the original design due primarily to the owner's concerns for privacy and security. However, we've introduced a alternating offset lap joint detail. Um, this is a punch detail that is, that, that is a technique used in that period to create, rather than welding, it's, it's using a weaving technique to interlock the vertical and the horizontals. This creates a woven texture and it happens at each of the gates. It doesn't show up very clearly in this uh, distant elevation, but, uh, and this happens at, at each gate in two lo locations. Uh, additionally, the gate has been recessed six inches from the windows to enhance a sense of depth and pay homage to the layering of the original entry porticos. I, I was told we have very short time, so I'm going quickly. Um, the gate has been recessed six inches from the window guard uh, to enhance the sense of depth and pay homage to the layering of the original entry porticos. Um, in reference to a comment on the steps, we're proposing a solid limestone step for durability. Um, the client will have somebody who maintains that and we also have a, um, a snow melt to eliminate uh, potential freeze thaw and damage. And then in terms of the lanterns, we, she, we've decided to uh, just keep the existing lantern. So there'll be no lantern replacement in this application. So May, if you wanna, are you controlling the slides, May? Yes, I'll switch it. Yeah, okay. So the, this is, um, you know, the, the, 
the original 19, um, I think that's 1940s tax photo on the left, the, it'd be in the, between the 50s, it became abandoned until the 80s and it was a parking garage. You can see they infilled everything with block and glass block. You can go to the next slide. It became in very disrepair with the graffiti uh, emulating Lower East Side, I guess at the time. These are the original condition where the gates are being removed, the gates and the, uh, and the um, uh, guards above. Continue. Hard line drawings of the changes. So you can see we've moved the Roman lattice up to better reflect the original condition. An example of the profiles where we're using layered stepped um, flat steel to create a sense of depth. This was also something that we were ta that was taken from the uh, original tax photos and a technique uh, recommended by our uh, foundry expert. You can begin to see some of the weaving. We've started calling out some of the specific profiles being used as well as the button head rivets at the intersection of the Roman lattice where the vertical and the diagonals meet. And then that weaving happens there. And then these are examples of buildings, which I can't read, May, um, where these techniques have been used. So that's the punch joinery, the uh, weaving as a, as a method of, of um, creating stability within those gates, and the layering of the, of the facade in terms of built up profiles. Just a rendering. The, this is a uh, section through the, the window guards out at the face. The, the plates on either side will be continuous, but the gates are set, set in as a step uh, in each of those locations. They solve, they create a sense of depth, but they also uh, allow us to meet the uh, code required maximum swing of a door out over the property line. So that was a, a, a second um, requirement of those and just further sections in, in detail. So we've thickened the, the spring line um, and, and used a series of built up profiles to create a, uh, a stepped profile at that, which is also something we extracted from the uh, original tax photos. And these are just plans. Solid stead treps. Uh, these are, um, excuse me, solid um, uh, tread uh, riser as solid block with a bull nose profile on the on the front. So the existing steps. We've also added one riser for safety because those exceed code. So it's four steps now. Interior remains unchanged from the previous application. Okay. Existing conditions photos. Is that the conclusion of your presentation? Yes, it is. That's the conclusion. Okay. All right. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Oh, I, I thought I saw a hand, but I guess that question may have been answered in the presentation. All right. Not seeing any questions at this time. Um, Rich, I believe on this one, we did not receive any written additional comments. Is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, then I guess we will move to our discussion. So I'm going to start unmuting you all or requesting to unmute you. So look for that request. And um, 
So the last time that we saw this application, we recognized how this, the entrances had been altered in the past to accommodate the new use and, um, and that there was this interior vestibule. And I think conceptually, everybody was okay with the idea of new gates within these openings, but asked that the um, details and proportions be restudied, um, in particular, raising the height of the transom bar to be at the spring line of the arches, and um, looking at the proportions and profiles of the uh, metalwork to be more evocative of the historic quality and profiles. So the applicant has presented some changes that today and we'll have a discussion about that. Um, Commissioner Devonshire, would you like to start this one? Sure. Um, I think I can approve it as presented, Sarah. Okay. Mayor Chen? Uh, I have no problem with it. All right, Commissioner Bland? Yes, um, same here. I just wanna say that uh, the last change that's being um, uh, demolished and taken out was a more radical departure, even though it was approved by the, by the commission. Um, and uh, I think therefore, when a more traditional approach is taken as we're seeing here, it's important to get uh, the proportions, the details as accurately as we can. And I think this has been achieved now, still an adaptive reuse, of course. <laughs> but uh, it's been achieved uh, adequately in my judgment to, uh, to be approved. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi. <clears throat> Excuse me, I agree. I, I think they've been very responsive and uh, I can approve this. Okay, and Commissioner Jefferson. I can approve this. Commissioner Gustafson. Uh, when you when you compare that 1980s tax photo and and this image on page 10 of the presentation, it's really hard to quibble with the success of this project. <laughs> All right, thank you, Commissioner Shamir Barron. I'm in agreement. Commissioner Holford Smith. I agree. And Chapin. Uh, yes, I I agree. Commissioner Goldblum. All right, I must have rolled out on the wrong side of the bed this morning. But <laughs> <laughs> the detailing is fine of the gate of the gates, but what's what hasn't been discussed and what was kind of skirted over in the in the in the presentation is the fact that what was a double height expression of a vestibule that was an out, a kind of indoor outdoor space that had the height of the full arches is is still being uh, curtailed by the construction of a mezzanine that previously was set back and is now coming right to the back of this lovely grill, black coming right to the back of this lovely grill. Um, and I, uh, in the absence of verification that that was the original condition, I think that the loss of the double height vestibule space as an interior visible uh, component of this facade is a significant loss. I can't support it. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, I do think we have enough to vote to approve this. So, um, uh, Commissioner Devonshire, would you make the motion? In the matter of 538 East 11th Street, the free public baths in the city of New York, East 11th Street Bath, an application to alter for the facade, I recommend approval, finding <clears throat> that the removal of the existing gates, framing, and tiles from the monumental openings will eliminate unsympathetic alterations that detract from the facade. That the proposed ironwork in the transoms will closely recall the original design that the new gates and framing will feature overall proportions that are well scaled to the openings. <laughs> the proposed neutral wood cladding in the open vestibule will be seen behind the gates and in shadow and will not call undue attention to itself. That the beveled edge of the mezzanine extension will be set back from the monumental openings, thereby minimizing its visibility. That the proposed light fixtures will recall the fixtures shown in historic photographs and are in keeping with the scale and design of the facade that the handrails are simply designed to feature minimal attention points. That the new standing seam zinc cladding at the bulkhead will have a neutral appearance that improves upon the existing condition. 
and that the proposed work will not diminish the spectral architectural and historic character. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second it. Okay, and Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. <clears throat> Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Nay. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Letvey? Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay, with 10 in favor and one opposed, the motion carries. Approved, and we'll move to the next item. Next item is number four, LPC 21 03547, application for an amendment. This is in the borough of Manhattan, block 621, lot one, 540 Hudson Street in the Greenwich Village Historic District. 538 to 540 Hudson Street is a utilitarian style gasoline filling station and open lot. 544 Hudson Street is a garage building extensively remodeled in 1934 to 36. The application is to amend the commission approval uh, from February 6, 2018 under LPC 19-09729 to demolish the existing buildings and construct a new building to include revising the penthouse and other rooftop accretions. Commissioners, I'd like to note that in February of 2018, uh, this commission approval at the subject uh, premises was contingent upon the applicant working with staff to reduce the visibility of the penthouse and rooftop mechanical equipment. However, as the construction documents were developed, code requirements prevented a reduction in visibility, and in some cases, it was increased. The application is uh, the applicant team, excuse me, is here to present their revisions to the proposal after we open the proceedings. Okay, thank you. I'll have to. Um make a motion. So I am again unmuting everyone to open the proceedings. Commissioner Holford Smith, would you make a motion to open the proceedings? Moved. And Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> okay. The applicant may begin. Please remember to unmute yourself uh, and you do have control of the slides. Thank you. Uh, David, can you uh, move the slide to the next one, please? Thank you. Uh, good morning, commissioners. I'm Elise Quaysbarth from Higgins Quaysbarth. Um, before we get started, I would just like to compliment the staff. Um, they've been uh, very thorough in their uh, review and also very responsive um, to, uh, to to the conversation, and it's been a, um, a pleasure, uh, as it always is, but especially um, this time, Leanne has been really terrific. Um, the site uh, is at 540 and 540. Hudson Street at the northeast corner of Hudson and Charles, um, as shown in the photograph. Currently on the site are a defunct gas station and an altered garage building. Um, at the public meeting in February 2018, the commission approved the demolition of the existing buildings and the construction of a new six-story residential building with a penthouse designed by Morris Ajmi Architects. Um, David, could you move the slide to the next one, please? Um, the commission found the height and massing consistent with the corner apartment buildings in the district and the undulating facade and its fenestration an appropriate interpretation of repeated projecting bays found on historic residential buildings in the historic district in Greenwich Village. Um, the commission also found that the presence of a visible setback penthouse floor featuring a sloped roof and painted gray cladding and limited rooftop appurtenances will be consistent with other modern buildings in the surrounding context and some historic residential buildings within the district. Um, that penthouse is not visible from this, uh, from this angle, but you, you'll see views uh, as, as we go along. The commission did stipulate that the applicant work with the staff to reduce the visibility and the team worked with the staff toward what appeared um, to be a promising solution. However, um, also including, and this is significant because it remains in the proposal, a reduction of the occupiable space in the penthouse. Um, however, there were code-driven requirements that were missing from that analysis. Since that time, 
the applicant team has been joined by a new development partner, Aurora Capital, and a new architect. Um, BKSK has carried the design forward um, to construction documentations uh, while um, working to implement the commissioner's conditions. A fuller understanding of DOB requirements includes some additional railings at the penthouse roof and a very small, I think, I think it's three inches um, of uh, elevator bulkhead increase. Um, BKSK did consult with DOB um, very carefully and they gained approval for the stair bulkhead uh, to terminate on the lower floor, which significantly reduces its volume. Um, and as I said, a significant reduction of occupiable space uh, remains part of this current proposal. Because the net effect of these reductions and updates um, and uh, increases, um, it results in a slightly increased visibility from what you saw um, back in 2018. So we're here to present it to you today. Um, and as you'll see uh, going forward, the rooftop appurtenances are only partially visible and they recede from the distinctive presence of the main building roof line. Um, they are, as the commission noted, consistent with penthouses and bulkheads visible on historic buildings in Greenwich Village. Um, and there's a little bit more about that in the presentation as we go forward. The design of the main building facade and its height remain unchanged. So uh, it, this is really all about the penthouse. Um, I'm uh, joined today by Jonathan Taylor um, from HQ, um, Matt Ebro from Aurora Capital, who's here to answer questions. The presentation will be undertaken by David Kubik and Harry Kendall from BKSK. So, um, David, I think it's yours now. Perfect, thank you. David Kubik, partner at BKSK. And as Lee said, I'm joined by my partner, um, Harry Kendall as well. Um, thank you, Elise, for the introduction, um, walking us through the project's history. We'd just like to say that we're very excited to help bring this project by the prior applicant um, to fruition. Um, since becoming involved, we've worked very carefully to develop the construction drawings, as Elise said, and have been meeting with the DOB regularly um, to work through any objections. Um, and as Elise said, we just want to reiterate that we're pleased to say that um, in this prominent view that none of what we're going to speak about today has changed what you're looking at now. There's one small storefront door change um, that staff's aware of, but that's, that's the only change to this view. Um, so we're here today because while meeting with the department building, some of the code requirements that Elise was referring to have required revisions to the rooftop of the building. Um, and we will show you those changes um, in plan and in views. Um, and we thought we would start actually with just a kind of simple roof plan. Uh, on the left is the roof plan that was presented during the 2018 public meeting. And the roof plan on the right is the proposed roof plan. And um, I'll walk through some of the basic changes that have been made. And then we can look at those changes more specifically in perspective views at street level. Um, so the first change we wanted to highlight was um, this change that's toned here in red. We've um, reduced the occupiable space on the seventh floor um, setback floor um, by uh, 260 square feet. It's a, a seven foot six um, uh, shift in that exterior wall to create a, a bigger setback that um, now measures 22 foot six where it used to measure 15 feet. Um, and you'll see hey, that David, to, be, to be perfectly clear that that red portion is not to be built. Just, just so correct. everyone's clear this, on This is what uh, you could sort of, if you compare from the left to the right, this is where it was. And we're now removing that toned portion and setting it back to the full uh, 22 foot six. Um, the, the next kind of major issue was that the, um, the existing or the previously proposed plan on the left had a um, required railing, but only at the uh, eastern portion of the roof. And since this is the main roof level of the building, we are required by code to provide um, a, uh, a guardrail, a railing, which we're highlighting here in blue. Fortunately, um, we are allowed to set it back substantially. Um, and you can see it is set back um, from the edge of that seventh floor volume. Um, another change that Elise started to describe was that um, we filed a determination with the billing department to ask, and they have approved that the uh, main egress stair for the building can terminate at the seventh floor um, and does not need to extend up as a bulkhead to the main roof. So here on the left, you can see where the stair bulkhead used to rise up and exit onto the main roof. 
And we're happy to report that we've now eliminated that volume. So the only bulkhead volume above the main roof level is the elevator bulkhead. Um, one other change to this fire stair configuration is that due to some FDNY requirements, we needed to extend that the footprint of that stair all the way to the Eastern lot line. Um, it did not grow in height, but it did extend to the Eastern portion. Oops, sorry about that. It did extend to the Eastern portion of the lot line. And we'll show you in perspective views that this change is not visible in any of the street views. Um, one other change is right next to the elevator bulkhead um, it, in both the previous proposal as well as what we're showing you today is where the trash chute flue is located. Um, a code requirement there that the trash chute needs to be six feet higher than any adjacent roof. Um, so we've had to extend that a little bit higher than what was previously proposed. Um, and it's basically a net increase of two foot three to get us to that six foot requirement. Um, also, um, Elise was correct in saying that um, working through the details of the elevator um, machinery itself and the roofing details, we did have to raise the coping around the elevator bulkhead, but only by three inches. Um, and the last change that I'll um, show you here in plan, and then we can start to look at these in the perspective views is that you can see these small square would almost look like tiles running around the edge of this roof. Um, those are green roof trays to comply with the local law 9294 requirements. And those are located um, on a portion of the, of the main roof that is sloped. Basically this outer zone that wraps around the perimeter of this seventh floor is sloped to a lower elevation um, to decrease the visibility of this seventh floor um, volume. And we'll show you the details for that in section. First, before we get to those perspectives, just to walk through these same elements in elevation. This is the west elevation um, presented in 2018, just highlighting in red the profile of, of that volume so that we can compare it against the next slide, which is the proposed elevation. You can see here on the right-hand side, this is that seven foot six inch um, setback where we've reduced the volume of the seventh floor. So you're seeing that benefit here. Um, you can see our, our larger trash chute, you, and you can also see where the um, stair bulkhead used to be, which has now been eliminated, and it's only the elevator bulkhead. You can also see the presence of um, the main roof railing um, added to this, uh, the, the top of this volume as we were looking at in plan. This is the south elevation um, as presented in 2018. Again, you can kind of see this sloped stair bulkhead with the stair door. And here on the proposed elevation, you can see that that stair bulkhead has been removed and the minor change to the trash chute. And again, because this is not a 90 degree corner, you actually get a little bit of a benefit to the setback um, in the west elevation as well. And on the right hand side, you can see how the stair bulkhead has been extended to the Eastern lot line. This is just a section through the roof to explain our strategy for how to incorporate the green roof trays. On the left-hand side in the previous proposal, there was actually a very thick, um, heavily insulated uh, roof assembly that afforded us a lot of dimension that we were able to um, detail differently and allow the green roof trays to sit within the exact same dimensions um, so to as not increase the visibility of, of that kind of finished roof surface. So the, the green roof itself, we've picked a, a species that only grows about two to three inches above the trays. So we don't believe that the growth will um, exceed the height as shown in this red dashed line. This is a detail of the, of the railing that we're proposing for that uh, new scope on the main roof, just trying to detail a railing that we think will be as minimally visible as possible using a stainless steel woven wire kind of cable mesh um, that we believe it tends to have a, a minimal visibility, a minimal impact on the view. And as we start to look at the elevations, we just wanted to kind of stop and pause for a minute and um, take a look at some other projects in the district and what you can come to expect when walking through the historic district in terms of visibility. Um, some of these projects 
the first two here on Horatio Street and West 12th Street, um, older projects not approved by the commission, but are in the district and have quite visible bulkheads and chimney structures. Um, and then the remaining four projects here, including notably on the right here, 534 Hudson Street, which is directly across the street from our site to the south, approved in 1998, um, has some visible bulkhead structures, chimney structures, flues, and, and partial penthouse um, structure visibility as well. Um, so we think what we're, we'll be showing you today um, is appropriate and in, con or in keeping with what you might find when walking through this historic district. So again, just, just a reminder that it, from this main view opposite, on the opposite corner, none of what, what we just presented has um, become visible in this prominent view. Um, moving west on Charles Street, the previously proposed on the left and what we're currently proposing on the right, um, we worked with prior applicant to um, uh, present the same perspectives for comparison. Um, we've worked to make them as accurate as we can be and also kind of increased a little bit of the kind of visual shadow of the cornice, which, we, which wasn't really showing as strongly in the previous views, but we think is actually important to understand how the main building kind of relates to or offsets the, the penthouse structures themselves. So if you look at the detailed views at the upper right or the top of the page, um, you can see some of the things we talked about in terms of um, that setback railing on the main roof or the trash chute being a little bit taller than it was before. You can see that the, the kind of curved corner of the seventh floor volume is now further to the left due to that um, decrease of occupiable space that we mentioned earlier. This is further back on Charles Street. And again, um, this view really kind of shows the benefit of that seven foot six um, setback where the volume is now positioned further to the left. Now this is moving south on Hudson Street. Um, and here you can see um, that railing is now becoming visible. The trash chute is a little bit higher and the elevator bulkhead, again, being about three inches taller than it was before. This uh, moving even further south on Hudson Street. Um, again, the same elements, you're just sort of seeing the trash chute a little bit here clipped by the um, building in the foreground. But you can also see how the, the seventh floor volume appear, appears a little bit shorter due to that setback, that reduction of occupiable space. This is a view from the north. Um, there was a rendering in the prior um, proposal in the presentation, which there is a large tree here. So we thought rather than render it with a large tree, we would just show you um, these wireframe views. Um, again, in this view, really what you might see as an addition is that uh, the new railing on the, um, the main roof. And what we also wanted to highlight was that we were able to remove one of the lot line windows um, and just showing um, these two uh, lot line windows only in our proposed design. This is a view east um, on Charles Street, looking back. And as we discussed earlier, um, we just wanted to study this view one more time to make sure that the extension of the fire stair to the eastern lot line um, was not of concern and it's not visible in this view, happy to report. And, and this view is, is unchanged from the prior presentation, which is why there's no comparison. So we just finished here with, um, again, this main corner view. Um, if there are any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions at all? Okay. All right, I'm not seeing any questions. Um, I believe we did get a, a letter on, on this item. Rich, can you note it for the record? Yes, we did get a letter in opposition from GBSHP. Okay, thank you. All right, any final questions, commissioners? Okay, so I'm going to start to unmute you all so that we can begin our discussion. And in some cases I'm requesting to unmute. So just accept that request. Okay, great. 
And um, Commissioner Lutfi, would you make a motion? I'm oh, sorry, we're, we're already closed. We can go right into our discussion. Okay. So this um, application is, we've seen this building a few times now, and, um, and this is an approved building. And as was presented um, for various reasons, including some code reasons, the um, penthouse portion as approved um, would be more visible than presented. The applicants have presented some modifications to it to try to make it comparable to what was approved. So I think in our discussion today, we will focus on um, the change at the penthouse and whether or not that's in keeping with the intent of the original approval. Um, so why don't we go ahead and start with um, Commissioner Gustafson, would you like to start this one? Sure, sure. Um, just to sort of get put a little framework around this, um, the applicant's program caused an issue for us the first time around, uh, and we made our approval contingent upon the applicant reducing the visibility um, uh, of the penthouse, um, so to adjust their program. Um, it turns out the program caused causes even greater issues because they missed um, the code requirements and the like. And now they have, I guess there's really two choices at that point. Um, you know, we could, uh, uh, they could, you know, change their program or, um, or ignore the issue. Um, and I think they've adjusted it. It's what I'm hearing. They adjusted the program slightly to, um, to reduce that additional visibility. Am I right about that? Yes, they have cut back the occupiable space. Um, right, okay. And that, and that to me is exactly the kind of response they should have made, which is to say, you know, you don't stand firm on the program at that point, you do something. Um, and, and so that takes me to the visibility studies. Um, and, uh, and, and I think in particular, because of the, um, uh, you know, the, the materials and the colors that, uh, and the, uh, uh, of the um, uh, the rooftop um, areas, um, it's very it's really hard to discern, um, and uh, and I as we saw, you know, some visibility is is to be expected in these situations in the village. So so I think this is appropriate. Okay, thank you, and Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, um, thanks, John, for clarifying all of that. Um, I agree with you. I think it is appropriate. Okay, Commissioner Holford Smith. I agree. Um, I think it's they've, they've, they've changed it um, as best they could to minimize visibility. So I think it's still appropriate. Okay, Commissioner Goldblum. Oh, sorry, Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yeah, I think uh, you know it's a large building, and rooftop accretions are you know typical in general of uh, this district as well as others. And if it were an individual landmark or a uh, you know a particular kind of very a building where I thought this uh, was drawing it due attention to itself. But I feel because this is a new building, and yes, a new building could be modified easily and all that, but I think because it's a new building that I can accept this kind of rooftop accretion is not really diminishing it that much that it's, it's a real problem for me. I do appreciate that the applicant worked very closely with our staff. We often have people coming back, having built things after the fact and saying, oh, well, we, we just didn't you know, know what to do or something. So I, I think the fact that they worked closely with the staff and, and took appropriate uh, actions to try to remediate the problem uh, it also weighs with me as, you know, it's an important, uh, it's an important consideration that uh, I think they're trying to do due do diligence here. So I can approve it as presented. Thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. I agree, it's appropriate. Okay, Commissioner Devonshire. Oh, he may have gone already. Okay, Commissioner Chen. Uh, likewise here. Okay, and Commissioner Bland. You know, it's a rare building in New York that you don't see something on the top of it. Um, and I think the applicant worked very hard to uh, minimize this, but to, to, but to see it, uh, but to see it over the top of a very interesting new design element, that cornice, that wavy cornice, still does not distract from 
uh, appreciating that design element so I can approve it as well. Commissioner <clears throat> Latfi? Yeah, I agree. I can approve it as well. That setback, I think, really helps um, from a visibility standpoint, especially at a distance. And I think this is going to be a nice addition to the landscape. Thank you. Commissioner Jefferson. I can approve it. Okay, so I think we are all in agreement on this. So uh, Commissioner Gustafson, would you make the motion? In the matter of uh, LPC 21-03547, 540 Hudson Street in the Greenwich Village Historic District, the application is to amend the commission approval on February 6, 2018 under LPC 19-09729 to demolish the existing buildings and construct a new building to include revising the penthouse and other rooftop accretions. I note that the previous approval for a new building had a stipulation that the applicant work with staff to reduce the visibility of the penthouse and the rooftop mechanical equipment, but at, that as the construction documents were developed, code requirements prevented a reduction in visibility. I recommend approval, finding that the presence of a visible setback penthouse floor featuring a sloped planted roof and planted and painted gray cladding and limited rooftop appurtenances, including an elevator and stair bulkhead, vent railings and mechanical equipment is consistent with other modern buildings in the surrounding context and some historic residential buildings within this historic district. That the south facade of the penthouse has been set back further from the Charles Street facade than initially proposed, thereby minimizing its visibility over the undulating cornice and that the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the streetscape or the Greenwich Village Historic District. And Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you second that motion? Second the motion. Okay. Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Had to leave. Oh, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay, with 10 in favor and unopposed, the motion carries. All right, that's approved. Thank you. And we'll move to the next item. Okay, next and last item of the day is number five LPC 20 11316 an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 151, lot 29, 315 Broadway building individual landmark, an Italian Renaissance style store and loft building built in 1861. The application is to demolish a portion of the rear of the building and construct a new building on a portion of the site. This was last presented at the public hearing of September 15th, 2020. And no action was taken at that time. The staff will now do a brief introduction. Good morning again, commissioners. Uh, Brian Blazak, Preservation Staff. Uh, the subject property is 315 Broadway, an individual landmark Italian Renaissance style store and loft building. <laughs> on September 15th, 2020, the commissioners reviewed a proposal to demolish a portion of the rear of the building and construct a 20 story, 210 foot tall, setback tower addition <clears throat> the landmark site and a 14 story component of the structure located off the landmark site at the corner of Broadway and Thomas Street. Most commissioners were comfortable with the removal of portions of the rear of the building and the ensemble approach for the new structure as it relates to the landmark and the surrounding context. There were requests to explore retaining more of the historic building. And the commissioners, <clears throat> excuse me, asked that the design of the new structure overall be more cohesive in and of itself, to be a compatible backdrop to the historic building and strengthen the overall composition of the ensemble. There were also some suggestions related to the massing and design references to nearby landmark buildings. No action was taken. As a result, the proposal has been modified as a response to that feedback. The applicants are here to walk you through the updated proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And we'll need a motion to open the proceedings. So Commissioner Chapin, would you make that motion? Motion to open the proceedings. 
Thank you. Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the applicants may begin. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Erin Ruley of Higgins Quays, Martha and Partners. Uh, Maura Sajmi and I will walk you through uh, the revised proposal today. Um, since it's been a few months since we've seen you, I'm going to uh, briefly summarize the thinking behind the um, overall proposal and its appropriateness, um, and Morris will walk you through the design. We're also joined uh, by Albert Lebose, the owner of the site from a, um, United American Land, and Nick Chelko of uh, Maura Sajmi Architects. Um, and so as Brian described, um, we heard your comments and um, we are uh, very excited to share with you today this uh, revised proposal. Um, and uh, specific to the, to the comments, the, this proposal addresses a few fundamental changes. Uh, first, we substantially increased the um, area of the landmark to be preserved. Um, and the design revisions encompass um, a few sort of big moves. Uh, first, the, that the two sections of the building visually engage um, to create a cohesive ensemble um, that continues the design related to the landmark. Um, as you might recall, we had uh, this, the segmental arches of the, of the historic facade um, were mirrored in the, the design of the setback portion, but the, as you see on the, the left-hand side, the, the corner portion was a, a distinct mass of its own with um, a brick fenestration pattern. Um, so compositionally, the corner building now uh, recalls the building that formerly occupied the site of 317 and its relationship with 315 Broadway. Um, and the corner building also draws on that late 19th century, early 20th century um, model of the narrow skyscraper. So um, if we look at the view on the right, the proposed uh, revised uh, design, you see that the base of the building, which mirrors the height of uh, the building that was uh, previously on the site, uh, steps down from 315 Broadway. And um, there's a material change between and an articulate articulation of the fenestration that changes between the base and the upper section of the building, which we think creates a, a much more deferential relationship. Um, and, the, and the palette, um, which is actually a play, it's all terrazzo, um, it's, it's a play with the aggregate size. So we'll have a, a smaller aggregate at the base and a larger aggregate um, at, the, at the upper section of the building. And that, um, it, again, responds to the, the Tuckahoe marble of the, of the historic building. Um, next slide. And just as a reminder of where we are, uh, here uh, at the southwest corner of Broadway and Thomas Street, the landmark um, is hatched in the map on the left and the uh, building at 317 Broadway, which is off of the landmark site, is shown um, in, within the boundary of the, the development site. And the photograph shows the existing five-story store and loft building, Palazzo style. Uh, constructed in 1861 and the two-story taxpayer to the north. Um, and just as a reminder that the entire proposal is, is uh, centered on the restoration of 315 Broadway and also provides for a new residential building that includes affordable housing, uh, which is much needed in uh, this, this district. Uh, next slide. Um, and so just overall view of the existing conditions, the facade is Tuckahoe marble that's been coated. We see that on the left in the overall view. There is um, a fire escape that extends the full height of the building. Um, and then we can see in the, in the detailed view on the right, um, the, uh, the existing base condition, which has been clad over for a good portion of the building's history. We see the, the cast iron columns popping out um, from beneath that, but this is really the, the pedestrian experience of, of the building today. Next slide. Um, based on Commissioner uh, Devonshire's comments at the, at the last hearing, um, we did a bit more investigation of the facade conditions. Jablonski uh, Building Conservation performed stripping samples uh, with a variety of products, um, and they, they did this in the area where the paint buildup was um, most significant. Um, and we determined that the, the coating is removable um, and it doesn't, won't damage the underlying masonry. Um, in addition, we, um, David Abramson, who will be the restoration architect for the project, um, and Carl Colbreth of Pre Preserve Contractors, uh, both visited the site. 
and um, evaluated the stone and both were comfortable that the, the stone was in good condition and could be conserved. Next slide. And then just to briefly walk through the, the proposed restoration again, uh, removing that coating from the, from the marble facade and cleaning, uh, repairing and consolidating as needed, repointing um, based on a mortar analysis, and then uh, removing that full height um, uh, non-historic fire escape. There is uh, currently a combination of window configurations. And so that'll be all be replaced with new two over two windows to match the historic condition. And then at the base of the building, removing all of that non-historic cladding and infill, um, uh, restoring the existing cast iron. We are assuming that the capitals of the cast iron columns have been removed um, just to accommodate that cladding system. So uh, that'll all be replicated in uh, cast iron, which was also another of Commissioner Devonshire's uh, concerns. Um, and I think you might recall that the, the South Pier has actually been shaved back and the, and the pilaster there is missing because it's cast iron. And so that'll all be replicated. Um, new, new storefronts will be wood to match the historic uh, documentation. Next slide. Uh, and here we see the, the restored um, landmark in the context of the new building proposal. Um, and again, it re really reestablishes that pedestrian experience of the building, uh, but also with the addition of the new building to the north, really knits the street wall back together and um, anchors the corner and um, really reinstates what would have been a, a proper Broadway termination. Next slide. And then just a few views along uh, Thomas Street. On the left, we see Thomas Street looking west, um, and on the right is looking over the existing 315, 317 building toward the facade of 315. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to be preserving a greater extent of the historic building. Previously, it was 50 feet uh, of the building that was being restored within the development, and now uh, we've increased that to 73 feet 6 inches, and we'll look at that in uh, a bit more detail. Uh, the other important thing about this view is that this is the only view you have currently of the, the rear elevation, and it's a very limited view, and any construction beyond what exists today at 317 Broadway would obscure the view entirely of, of that, that rear elevation. Um, next slide. Uh, with regard to the removal of the, the rear, uh, rear portion of the building, uh, we found that buildings historically um, of this age and type did exist on smaller footprints. Um, so reducing the depth of the building um, into the block would not compromise the legibility as a store and loft building, um, as we see in these examples all in lower Manhattan, primarily on West Broadway and, and Church Street. Next slide. And so here we see the, uh, the previous proposal. This is the, the axons that really explained the, um, the volumetrics of what was happening for the previous proposal. Again, uh, maintaining 50 feet of uh, the, the landmark building, reconstructing 20 feet within the overall uh, development for the uh, commercial section of the building, and then treating the two sections of the um, residential development as uh, distinct masses. And that has evolved um, as part of our um, addressing your comments. Next slide. And then just to get into the details a bit more of um, the area to be retained as part of the, uh, of the landmark to be retained as part of the new construction. You can see here, previously it was the, the first 50 feet of the, of the building. Now that has increased to 73 feet, six inches. So the area to be removed, which was previously approximately 40 feet is now reduced to 16 feet. Um, and uh, Morris can talk to you more specifically, but there are some code, code issues that we're working through that really um, drive this, this, um, uh, this extent. So next slide. And here we see the two proposals compared uh, with the previously proposed on the left and the currently proposed on the right. Uh, so again, that uh, 73 feet, um, 73 and a half feet of the existing landmark to be retained within the overall development increased from just 50 before. Um, and then treating the two sections of the massing um, as, a, as a unified composition, which again is a significant change. Um, and then just as a reminder, um, this is not simply a case of 
preserving the facade of the landmark, the entirety, the, the landmark will remain an independent commercial building and the residential building is completely separate from um, uh, or independent of the, of the commercial building. Next slide. Um, we had a very long history um, uh, that we discussed the, the last hearing. Um, and so this sheet basically summarizes all of that. Um, and uh, the um, uh, site historically had three distinct phases of development, uh, which we see here that express the visionary and ambitious character of the, of the context for this proposal. Um, on the top, we see the, the earliest, the origins of the site with uh, as the original site of New York Hospital in the uh, mid 18th century. And you see the full block running from Duane Street to Worth Street um, and the hospital set within the mid block condition and uh, 315 just to the south of that. And so this introduces that idea of uh, looking beyond the Broadway street wall to something more. Um, and then in the late 19th century, uh, the blocks were divided and um, Thomas Street was extended through the site and um, they were fully developed by this remarkable commercial development of, of cast iron loft buildings by Griffith to Thomas and um, for the textile trades. And uh, here we see the increasing density of the city. And then subsequently in 1929, um, a, a scheme for a 150 story skyscraper was developed um, and imagined for the blocks. And where that portal is, is essentially the, the cross of, of Thomas Street. And so it would have um, joined the blocks together again in the site. And then um, finally, on the bottom right, we see the context as it exists today, which um, is dominated by the mid to late 20th century developments, um, continuing the evolution of the area, but really moving away from that, that dense street wall development of uh, the historic city. And next slide. Um, and so here are the Thomas twins. Um, on the left, the view on the left shows 317 Broadway at the far left and 319 Broadway on the north side of Thomas Street. These, these are twin buildings that flanked uh, Thomas Street. 317 previously existed on the site of the existing McDonald's building. And um, they framed Thomas Street. Um, and on the right, we see the, um, uh, those buildings in context. So 315 Broadway is rising up slightly above uh, 317 Broadway. Um, and uh, that's uh, all reading against this eclectic scale and, and dense character of, of Broadway in that view. So next slide. Um, so, and, and here we see that direct relationship between 315 and 317 Broadway. The, the rhythm of that arcuated facade marching along uh, Thomas Street, which is echoed across uh, or mirrored across the street at 319. Um, but then that um, subtle jog in the cornice lines between 317 and um, uh, 315. And this view was really helpful in um, our thinking about your comments at the hearing and how the revised proposal might draw on that site specific history um, and achieve the energetic and cohesive design that's really required here. So next slide. And of course, um, reflecting again on the um, 1925 Titan City exhibit, uh, tracing the city's evolution and the, the visionary thinking of the 1920s. So we see from the um, origins of the city building up to that, those visionary ideas of the 1920s. Um, and so this collage and its, its rich layers really represent all of the generations of development that, have, that are deeply embedded in the site um, and that what we're building this proposal on today. Next slide. Okay, and so just to sort of dig into the details of, um, of the design changes and the inspiration for, for our revised proposal, um, the 317 site, which is off of the landmark site, is um, fairly narrow. It's 25 feet wide and extends 105 feet into the block. Um, and so it has very narrow frontage on Broadway. So we looked at how these sites were developed historically. Uh, first with this fantastic illustration by Thomas Nast in 1898, um, which really, um, it's a bit of a caricature, but it really is illustrating the developing city and how we think about buildings superimposed on other buildings. Um, and again, echoing that urban collage that we've been, we've been talking about consistently throughout the proposal. 
Um, and then on the right, seeing how that's manifested in, in the built fabric of the city. On, uh, this is Union Square West, um, and there are a handful of individual landmarks in here. The, the building at the south end of the block is the Bank of the Metropolis. Again, pretty comparable con conditions to um, uh, 317 Broadway. But what's really fascinating about this is that three, um, it, the Bank of the Metropolis extends all the way back, um, is L-shaped in plan, and the building on the north end of the block is also L-shaped in plan, and they join. It was part of the, the intent of this, this, this composition that they have this U-shaped plan. Um, and, and then that's all, of course, juxtaposed with the lower scale infill along, along the um, Union Square West frontage. But it's this amazing example of the inventive urbanistic compositions that really characterize New York City. Um, and so then building on that, next slide, please. Um, we looked at um, other buildings of this type in the city, um, tall buildings between 12 and 14 stories on narrow sites. So comparable conditions to, to three, 317 Broadway. Um, and these buildings, uh, it's so interesting. They all relate at two different scales. They have this pedestrian scale with the strong differentiated bases and then the larger urban scale um, above. Um, we see um, uh, material changes between the base and the upper section of the building, also changes in articulation and expression, fenestration. Um, and we started to think about how this compositional quality might help the new building off of the landmark site relate to the landmark better. Um, and so here I'm going to um, pass the presentation over to Morris and um, ask him to sort of dig into the details with you of the, the design proposal. Thank you, Aaron. Um, good morning. Um, thank you, Chair Carroll, Commissioners, staff, and Brian for the introduction. Um, as Aaron mentioned, we uh, responded to the comments as, a, as they pertain to the historic structure, but I believe also the comments really improve the overall design um, and relate the way the building relates to 315, the landmark, um, the context, as well as uh, 319, which was previously a twin. Uh, for 317. Um, Nick, next slide, please. Um, so the previous slide was a summary of uh, four tall corner buildings that we looked at. Um, we dove in a little further and broke down those buildings and noticed that they were organized in typical basements and top of separate tiers. We also noticed that those were further broken down and we used that approach um, on our uh, scheme as well. Um, so you can see similar breaking down of these uh, tiers um, with particular, um, uh, oh, we'll get to the hours in a second, one more. Um, and in the, in the next uh, slide after this, um, you can see uh, our proposed corner building, uh, which is really knitted back into this overall ensemble, I think much better now in terms of the materials and the, also the overall organization. And as Aaron mentioned, and you'll see in a few, minutes, uh, the height of the, that base, that um, uh, lower portion relates to 319, but also pays deference to 315. Um, and um, we have a, a, a sketch here, um, which shows those three tiers. You can see here, and you'll see um, in the next slide as well, uh, that the height of um, the lower portion relates to 319 across the street. Um, and has uh, a series of arches at the base, um, round top arches that then morph into the flat top uh, sculpted elliptical arches as it moves up. We've um, uh, accentuated the string courses that separate those um, individual uh, tiers as well as the sub uh, sections of those tiers as well. Um, and you can see that the height here uh, aligns Although it's not a twin, it is definitely has a familial relationship to the building across Thomas Street. Um, we're proposing uh, a um, precast terrazzo material with uh, stone uh, in the matrix uh, with a slightly smaller um, uh, aggregate on the lower portion. So that'll read a little darker than the upper portion, but we're looking to use the same material and we feel like that is appropriate 
for the position of those um, precast elements on the facade. And so uh, the lower portion uh, is on the left, uh, which shows the uh, darker uh, material and the upper portion and the setback portion on the right. Um, and I'll get into the details of the facade a little bit now. Um, here's a sketch showing the, um, the building um, in the site, which reminds us of some of the drawings that uh, Aaron showed earlier from the Titan exhibition. So um, in the next shot, we see the, the rendered view. You can see how the, the base element of the building relates to 319 uh, just to the north, um, as well as allows the cornice of 315 um, to be more prominent. Um, and the arches uh, start as elliptical arches on the lower, uh, on, the, on the base, uh, then the round topped arches, and then uh, to the flat top arches. And we crowned uh, both um, buildings with uh, a string course, um, arched windows, and an accentuated uh, cornice. Um, the details uh, we'll see now. Um, on the left is the existing condition. The center was a previous uh, proposal, and I think you see the more harmonious relationship on the right, what we're proposing now um, in, the, um, in this next image. This is uh, the, restore, the, re, the, re, the proposed restored uh, storefront for 315, which is based both on observations at the site as well as renders that we have um, from uh, the late 1800s. Um, this is a proposed base uh, for our building with the precast elements. The, the setback on the, for the glass is about, is 10 inches. Um, and then all of the cornices project beyond that. So at those points, we have uh, over a foot of depth, um, as you can see from the edge of those uh, projections to the uh, face of the glass. Um, this is the next, uh, the, the tier above the storefront with the round top windows, double hung windows, um, and um, the precast elements. Uh, in the next uh, image, uh, this is a, the second tier um, above with the flat top windows, but the arches at the, so that would sort of torque out um, and become uh, an arch uh, element at the precast uh, edge, um, which you can see. Uh, both on the left and um, on the on the little um, rendered elevation on the right. Um, and then uh, one other comment that came up at the previous uh, hearing um, was a uh, question about the articulation of the south uh, facade. And we're proposing to uh, do the same articulation as we're showing on Thomas Street with a blind facade, so there won't be any windows there. And that has a four inches of setback between the infill panel um, and the outside of the pilasters. Um, uh, here we see the two cornices at the top of the corner building, as well as the top of the setback portion, um, again, with the round top uh, windows there um, and the accentuated cornices. And that was one of the comments uh, that we heard at the last hearing was the top and the finish of that setback portion didn't seem strong enough. And so we've accentuated that. Um, uh, and now we have a series of views of the building uh, with the existing on the left, the previously proposed in the center and what we're proposing now on the right. And um, I believe that the color change, um, as you can see here, is uh, works better with the overall ensemble um, and the streetscape. Uh, next image, uh, this is looking northwest. Um, you see the setback portion, I think works well uh, with the new corner uh, design and articulation. Next, um, and this is looking straight west, which is um, a pretty open view. And I think this also works well here. And then we have a few more views here. Um, looking south, uh, which is similar to the view we saw before, but you can compare it to the previous uh, design. And uh, this is, a, I believe, the last one looking south. And that's it. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, commissioners, questions. Commissioner Goldblum, please go ahead. Hi, thank you. A um, couple of questions. Can you talk a little bit about the um, uh, efforts to preserve the structure on the historic building and um, explain the um, incursion into the envelope beyond the 75 foot point? Um, and also just talk about why if you have you know, it's basically kind of you know one ensemble why you couldn't do windows on your on your on your south part on your south wall of your mid-rise mid-height building okay um i'm going to let nick respond to some of the code requirements and issues as it pertains to um uh the removal and the retention of the portion of the rear of 315, and then I can respond to some of the other comments about the windows and the um, the overall design. Nick, right. So the the you know what we're calling um, sort of the build back portion of the landmark would consist um, almost entirely of stairs, elevators, uh, code requirements for, for bathrooms and that sort of thing that all, all service, um, the, the office commercial use of the, the landmark itself. So, um, you know, when we, when we took another look at this, um, you know, we realized, well, it was the non-combustible material under the, um, new development that was really the issue. So we maintained um, as much of the, or excuse me, as the combustible material that was the issue. So we maintained as much of the non-combustible material, the brick, the lot line walls, as was possible for the plan. And that um, would, would really encompass and uh, those new elements that, that help to, to serve the, the future use of the landmark. Um, in, in terms of the, the question about the windows on the south facade, most of the plan are bathrooms uh, and core elements. So we certainly could add windows there, but we saw this as a common um, design element on blind facades. So um, that's, that, that, that's what we're proposing. We certainly could have a few windows, but we felt like it was stronger as one um, composed elevation. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. Um, I, I understand the handling of the facade, but one of your strongest point of your proposition is the overlap of the two towers, the kind of overlapping of them. Explain to me why, what, why that gesture, um, which is very strong, um, how, how did that come about in terms of, of, of your design? In terms of the um, interaction between the corner building and the setback building? Correct. The, uh, the, the modern overlap that you have there, which is, yeah. which is quite dominant, it's powerful. Yeah, um, I, you know, as, as Aaron mentioned, we looked at some of the L-shaped buildings and the way that those worked. Uh, originally, we, we felt that that corner building was um, uh, better as a quieter statement that allowed the setback portion and the um, uh, landmark to work together. But I think in hindsight and after the comments that we heard at the last hearing, that it works much better with those um, three working together as a, as, a, as a unified ensemble. And I think that corner condition is accentuated by using the same window treatment and materials on those two portions of the building. I think it works very well. And, and my, my concern was the overlap with the fenestration uh, repetition. You know, I think you resolved it. I think I just wanted to know what was the thinking behind it. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I have a similar comment following up uh, Commissioner Jefferson's. Uh, that rear setback building's facade and the articulation, I think will be, um, I would love some explanation because it is indeed very dominant. 
especially looking from the uh, uh, from Broadway side, uh, from far away on one of your renderings. Uh, my question is whether is there's a way to um, do further articulation or break up the masses, uh, and because it looks uh, very monolithic. Well, I would say that um, with, as, as part of the original presentation, um, we looked at the uh, landmark building and the fenestration and the depth of that facade and the arch top windows and use that as inspiration for uh, the setback portion. Um, I think that there will, there's going to be a significant amount of building depth with the sculpting of that edge um, <coughs> above the window. Um, and then there's further articulation at the top of the building. And since it also relates to that portion that wraps around the corner, we felt that that was the appropriate um, response in terms of how the facade was organized. And just as a follow up to Commissioner Goldblum's uh, a question about the southern windows, uh, uh, you know, I, I think uh, he, he does have a good point it, to the degree that is possible, I think that area, uh, you could uh, further enhance it. Okay. Commissioner Chapin, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, just uh, uh, if you could, uh, for a moment, just uh, discuss again the uh, Thomas Street elevation. Um, I think that both on the Broadway and the Thomas Street, you have uh, you know, try to relate more to the scale of the historic building and create some separation from the historic building. So uh, just uh, if you could run through what you've done there to uh, get, give some respect in scale and uh, to, the, uh, to the historic building that's uh, adjacent to the new building on the um, Thomas Street side. That's in... Slide. Yeah, Nick, do you want to pull up that elevation? Um, yeah, it's on, uh, what's the? The, the sketch. Elevation. 45, I think. 45. Yeah, well, we initially looked at um, replicating um, 319, um, but there were some issues with the floor to floor heights and also um, uh, we felt that it was more appropriate to build uh, a unified building there. Um, mm -hmm. it, we're, we're still maintaining uh, a setback portion uh, uh, at the um, at Nine Thomas. So that uh, portion that's set back, set, we're calling the setback portion of the building um, that's set back from Broadway is also set back. And there is a, a, a small uh, recess between um, our corner uh, building um, or corner portion of the building and the uh, landmark um, to the west of it, which if you can indicate that. We also have a, um, a drawing of what that looks like from the previous proposal. We can pull that up if you'd like. But there is a gap oh. and a setback between those two buildings. Right, yes. and I think I would, I would add to that that um, now that we've um, created this very strong base um, for the for the corner building. There are certain alignments with, uh, I think it's Eight Thomas, the the individual landmark to the to the west. There are certain alignments, but also that that sort of rhythmic arcuated um, composition really has a nice resonance with with Eight Thomas. Um, and I think there's there are different ways of looking at that that setback on Thomas Street, um, we've always looked at it as giving the landmark a little bit of breathing room um, in terms of the, the, new, the new design. Um, and, I, and, I, and I know there are other, other perspectives on that, but that's how we've always considered it. Thank you. Commissioner Holford smith Yes, I had a question about the south facing facade of the setback tower and how that would be finished. Is that, would that be treated in a similar way as the corner building? I don't that, think I correct. see that. Yes. It will have the same, the same articulation. Yes. Okay, thanks. All right, any other questions?
All right, not seeing any questions, I think we can move to our discussion. So I am now starting to unmute you all or request to unmute you. So look for that. And um, I want to thank uh, the applicants for their presentation today. And, um, you know, I think at our last public hearing, um, we had a, a very interesting discussion about citing a. Sarah, you, you, you want to close the. Uh... Oh, I guess you don't have to. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> don't trip me up now. <laughs> um, we had an interesting discussion about citing um, new buildings on the back of landmark sites and, and how one could set it back to, to have it read as something else. And the applicants um, presented um, examples of corner buildings that wrapped building, uh, shorter buildings. Um, in this neighborhood along Broadway. Um, they also showed the depth of some of the other smaller buildings to show that the amount of depth being left here was still consistent with some of the smaller buildings on the district. And I think that for many of the commissioners, the conceptually this um, scheme seemed to be um, approvable, but there were some concerns about the amount of fabric being retained and, and uh, the applicants were asked to explore um, retaining more historic fabric. Um, and then there were a lot of comments about the design and how um, the design was sort of articulated as two different things and could it be more of an ensemble, uh, more of a comprehensive approach to the designs so that all three elements in this composition had a relationship to each other. Um, and then there were some other comments about massing and um, sort of referencing the original height. So I'm going to um, go ahead and um, start the discussion. And Commissioner Bland, I think you were fairly supportive of this approach and mostly were interested in the idea of the collage and the ensemble and how the design related to each other. So ah. would you like to start? Well, thank you for reminding me of what I was interested in. <laughs> And I was just going to use the word collage again in my uh, in my uh, uh, thoughts right now. Um, <clears throat> I want to suggest um, first of all that um, Morris has has given us, uh, I would say yet again, um, kind of a master class in analysis of the existing condition <clears throat> and existing context. And um, uh, you do it, Morris. I think as well as anybody that that comes before us. And I think analysis of the context is critical, but if you can't go beyond the context with something creative and interesting as a new building, then you're kind of stuck with replication or something like that. And, um, and of course we don't have that here, uh, but I just want to uh, uh, kind of point out the value of mm -hmm. a deep dive into the context of uh, uh, of the surrounding uh, vernacular. Um, I, I, I do think that this is an, an inspired and, and, and deeply uh, intellectually uh, grounded uh, uh, proposal now. I think the change of, uh, of color uh, adds a lot. I'm, I'm not sure what I said before. I might have even said I like the old two-tone two scheme, but I think this is, is better. It works as an ensemble. <clears throat> it fits in with the context very well. Um, um, and I think you, you, I mean, the history of the site is so extraordinarily interesting too. The, <coughs> the twin buildings and, and what was proposed to be a 150 story building. I had forgotten that part of this thing. Um, and anyway, um, I, I'm, I was supportive before. Um, I think the, the new setback is, is better. And I think this is a, a, just a very interesting scheme and I'm certainly ready to think it's a, an appropriate addition to this piece of Broadway. <clears throat> Thank you. And Commissioner Goldblum, you too were uh, comfortable conceptually um, with the sort of graph onto the landmark site and the overall height, um, but you did have also some concerns about the sort of approach to the design and the kind of comprehensive um, or ensemble of, uh, wanted them to study more so of an ensemble and um, concerns about maintaining more historic fabric. So they've shown that today and answered some questions about it. So how are you feeling now? 
Okay. Um, uh, better. Um, I think that the um, degree of retention of historic material on the existing building hasn't changed substantially. They're keeping the, the party wall, the, the side walls, which is good. Um, but I think that it's, I think it's appropriate nevertheless to, uh, and I can accept that. I think that the uh, change in color and kind of the, the, the change of the kind of the concept really uh, from a two build, a, a, a three building collage to a single building with two elements that embrace the historic building is much more successful. Um, I think that the notion of articulating the base, lo the lower six stories, whatever it is, two, four, five, six stories, as, um, as a kind of shadow of the twin uh, across the street is, is, is uh, successful. Uh, I'm a little bit dubious as to the um, differentiation that's shown in the rendering. When I look at the two terrazzo samples, it doesn't look like you're going to get that much differentiation, but um, I, I still think it's okay. Um, and I think it's a nice gesture. Um, interesting thing about this building, and I don't oppose this quality, but it just, it just occurred to me that, you know, in Morris's looking at the context of the early 20th century taller uh, buildings along Broadway, what he's got here is kind of an interesting and kind of a little bit weird, but interesting blend, right? If you look at how the, the uh, 20th century buildings are developed, not only are they taller, but they, they use a heroic scale, right? They either have a two-story heroic scale as expressed by the building immediately to the left, or they have a a real tall central shaft that's unarticulated and that's meant to be viewed as one volume. That's again, a very tall element that's read as a continuous thing or as a heroic scale thing. But Morris is using the vocabulary and the tool set of the cast iron era where the module is one story tall, right? If you look at, if you look at you know, his shaft space, it's all these one-story tall, you know, adiculae with, with, you know, post, post, and little arch top. And, and the module is really very small. And it kind of, it's, it's kind of like a, it, it's not really a, not, it's not really a modern version of the, 19, of the 20th century buildings. It's more like a modern version of the, of a stretched cast iron building in terms of the scale of the elements. And I think it works. It's okay. It's a little... It's a little unusual, but I think it's okay. Um, I think that the south wall being blind, but carrying the articulations is appropriate. Um, I think it would have been better if it were windows, but I think it's okay as it is. The one thing that I would strongly, strongly, strongly suggest that was not addressed is the relationship between this building and the landmark building to its west, which is still uh, completely uh, exposed at, uh, through the recess of the entrance on um, uh, Thomas Street, I think it is. <laughs> um, so I would just suggest that, that the architect work with the staff to extend the volume of the building. Uh, it can even be empty, but it, it, it should carry the street wall in some manner to abut that historic building and restore that historic building to its street wall condition and not have it to be kind of exposed on its west side. All right, thank you. And um, Commissioner Lutfi, I think you were uh, fairly comfortable with the approach, but also had uh, thoughts about the design. Yeah, I, I just to echo some of the things that um, Michael and Fred said, uh, I think as always, <laughs> when Morris goes back to do some more work, he really does his homework and it, and it does show here. And I truly appreciate, as they've said, all of the investigation analysis 
of the early 20th century architecture and the surrounding context and the exploration of, you know, the articulation of these buildings um, and dividing them up into different sections. It was all, it's all really thoughtful and it shows in the end result. And I, I think what he's created here is a wonderful um, design that, that works well as an ensemble and yet um, the two buildings on the, the building on the corner and the original uh, and the original landmark structure also stand on their own. And, and that's wonderful because that is what the streetscape is all about. And then the articulation on with, within the mass itself follows the rhythm. Um, that exists in the in the landscape of the street, which is is wonderful. Um, uh, the change in color goes a long way to um, to really making this very cohesive and also blend in better uh, with the surrounding architecture. I'm so glad that um, so much uh, fabric was able to be retained and the the project works so much better now at the street level um, as a result of that and it also obviously is uh you know the the uh, landmark the smaller building seems very well preserved I, i'm not having a problem with um the fact that there are no windows on the south side because there is a lot of articulation there. And, and plus, I just think it would in a way have made that that part of the project more difficult because the building's not that wide. So if you put on, uh, you know, on a wider building, like the one uh, further down on the street here, you can accommodate that because you can put your core in different places. But I think it would have made it more diff difficult here. So um, I think it's great. Okay, thank you. And I know Commissioner Chen, you had a thought or a question about those windows, but having heard the answer about the core and some of the other thoughts, how yeah. are you feeling now? No, I, I think Jeannie, uh, uh, Commissioner Lefty made a good point, which is that it is a very narrow building. And I think the applicant um, uh, is successful as Commissioner Blend said um, in, uh, in the corner compared to last time, this is a much better improvement in breaking up the masses into a base and then a multi-tier going up and then it's contextual and it's respectful to the adjoining landmarks and make reference to the other historic structures across the street. Uh, my, um, and I, I also think that Commissioner Goldblum made the excellent point uh, and that was a part of the reason for my question earlier. If you look at the building to the south, they have a much heavier, uh, deeper um, multi-level uh, loggia on the top. And I just thought that in this case, I share the sentiment of Commissioner Goldblum that it may be able to use, I don't want to play designer here because you have an excellent architect here, architectural firm here, uh, but I just somehow thought that a, a heavier top uh, may be able to cap this thing from the, the building in the back, the setback building in the back from keep on rising uh, to infinity. But overall, uh, you know, I, 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 I can support it. Commissioner Shamir Barron, I think you thought there were some interesting um, things to think about here last time as well. Yes. Yeah, uh, I did and I do. <laughs> I, uh, I would ask mostly two things. One, that, that they look at the Corbin building especially and, um, and I think they, they really have studied these kind of flat corner, skinny flat corner buildings in a, in a way that's giving them, given them so much more information. And the second thing was the extension of the historic building interior. Um, and, I, and I'm glad that they've considered doing that. What's, um, and, and so there, and there are a couple of things that are, I think still really interesting here. I was, um, what, what Aaron said about the kind of the, 
it's, it goes, the project shows us that it's sort of beyond collage. She referenced this kind of the urbanistic interlocking, the hidden connections um, in, in, in and among these buildings historically and now referenced here. And I think that the, the um, palette, this kind of lighter palette for all of the buildings accentuates that kind of the, the, the hidden, but the understood um, interior logic of these, of these buildings. And, and I think that that's really interesting. I have no idea what this terrazzo material will look like. I think it's kind of, it's, it's weird and it could be really ugly and interesting, <laughs> but um, I find that that's, I, I accept that as an exploration and I can imagine that, that, that there will be interest around it. Um, again, I, I don't know what it means or what it would look like. I also um, think I might disagree with, um, with uh, Commissioner Goldblum and, and as well um, as, uh, the others who have, some of the others have said that there's a need to um, sort of smoothen the relationship with the Thomas Street historic building. I actually think it's uh, the separation from it, the kind of the jog around it is, is important because because I don't want them to kind of iron out everything with this. I mean, there's plenty of ironing out going on here. They're proposing a giant building, set of building parts. And I don't think the whole thing needs to be kind of smoothed over. Um, and I also accept this um, other awkward aspect, which is that the, um, the tallest element does not resolve in a kind of um, heavy, a heavy, defined end. I think that there is this kind of expression of, you know, we could have, we would have gone taller if we could have. So, uh, you know, all of these kind of awkward aspects are, are actually, I think, interesting and um, rhetorical. And um, I still am very excited about the project and accept it. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Jefferson? Um, I, I think this is an incredible urban project. I particularly like the modern idea of volumes that overlap each other and, and the overlapping forming an L that embraces the historic buildings. And it, 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 it works very well. The overlap uh, is a, a very important point from my, concern, from my point of view because it shows it, it's, it's contextual and yet it has this modern tendency of overlapping. Um, I, I wrote notes here, um, a well-dissolved facade, proportions, repetition of elements and patterns are very well-dissolved. I particularly like the analysis of the building facade references that they did before. I think it's an instructive way of looking at the context. And, um, and I, I, I found it admirable that the, they referenced the 319 Broadway building across the street in the facade, you know, so they, I mean, this is intellectually and, and architecturally a very rich project. Therefore, I approve it. All right, and Commissioner Gustafson? Um, I have no um, criticism of, of, of the design. Um, my original objections were not about the design and, and they remain the same as they were before. Um, they're about the concept, and the concept is about uh, what we're doing to um, a significant section of an individual landmark. Um, and this is what it seems that it's come to. We're, we're not talking about putting rooftop additions on an individual landmark or building uh, uh, a, a, a tall structure in an historic district, but we're talking about putting that, um, that tall structure right directly on top of that individual landmark. Um, uh, the, as I said the first time, it's, it's, it buries the individual landmark and the individual landmark is overwhelmed. Um, we've moved from what we called last time flagrant facadism to just regular old vanilla, regular facadism now. Um, and uh, so I can't, I can't, uh, I have nothing bad to say about the design, but I, I can't accept the concept. Thank you. 
Commissioner Holford Smith. I think that this is a tremendous improvement over what was presented last time. <clears throat> and I think using the analysis of these tall, skinny buildings um, to generate this, this new um, proportional change to the facade has really been successful. So, and I think change of tone to make it all uh, one or shades of one color um, has really made this read as a, you know, a really unified composition. So um, I'm in support of it. And I, as someone who had previously worked on the little eight Thomas street many years ago, which is such a beautiful little building. I just hope that that careful attention is paid to the details between the new building and eight Thomas street. And commissioner Chapin. Uh, yes, I was concerned last time as other members about the retention of uh, historic fabric. And I actually think that uh, they have made a, a good uh, move in that direction to uh, try to re retain more of the uh, exterior walls. Uh, and, you know, we're losing 16 feet are going to be covered. But I think, you know, it's the main portion of the building is is going to be retained. So. I feel better about that. Um, I also, as other commissioners, feel that the design ensemble in the, is much more successful. The lighter color, uh, including the two-tone use, uh, uh, is much more successful, uh, more referential, and appropriate, um, in, including the in, uh, setbacks and the cornices. I think it works for me very well on the Broadway side, uh, the relationships and on the Thomas Street side, I understand Michael's uh, concern about the street wall connection, but like Adi, I was very, uh, as because I was very concerned about the presence of that small building in, in its context, I actually think that the recess is helpful and appropriate uh, in this particular case uh, to uh, keep the large the building from being overpowered by the large buildings uh, uh, surrounding it. So um, I think that uh, this overall is is a uh, a very good proposal, which uh, in a couple of very very substantial buildings in context with uh, these smaller buildings and achieved a good relationship. So I can approve it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and thank, you know, I'm going to thank the applicants for an interesting presentation originally and um, for really being so thoughtful about all of our comments. And of course, I want to thank the commissioners for all of your thoughtful comments. Um, which I think, you know, cumulatively, cumulatively, we have all come together with a um, scheme that I think is very interesting. I think grounded in um, historic relationships of buildings to each other, particularly along this area of Broadway. And I think that the individual landmark will still stand out and that the design um, responses um, to make this more of a comprehensive ensemble will, will really support the individual landmark. So I think we're at a place, place where we can um, support it. And I think, um, mm. you know, we've heard Nick's comments about the relationship on Thomas Street. And I think that Commissioner Goldblum's concern was more about the gap between the two, not the mm -hmm. um, recess, not the plane of the facade. So I think we could ask them to continue to study um, how to treat that gap, um, and maybe we'll leave that a little bit open for them to work on that with staff. So with that, um, but but keeping the plane where it is. So with that, if I got that right, Commissioner Goldblum, would you make that motion? Sure. Thank you. Hold on a second, let me scroll down here. Okay, <laughs> regarding 315 Broadway, an individual landmark, the application is to demolish a portion of the building and construct a new building on a portion of the site. Um, I recommend approval, noting that the demolition of the rear of the historic building, including a portion of both party walls and the utilitarian rear facade with plain brickwork and punched openings, will not result in the removal of any highly significant architectural features. 
and will allow for the building to be reconfigured in a manner that supports its adaptive reuse. The footprint of the historic building that will remain and will be consistent in, with the depth of some other buildings of similar type, age, and scale in this historic district. But the surrounding streetscape and backdrop features backdrop <laughs> features numerous tall buildings. Therefore, the presence of a 20-story tower addition set back 50 feet from the street wall <laughs> will be read as a separate building in keeping with the scale of the surrounding building. That the proposed tower is composed as a part of a comprehensive design for a more expansive structure that includes a 14-story corner lot co component located off the landmark site. And this overall composition reinforces the disassociation of the tower from the historic building. That the contemporary design of the, of the tower and, and overall structure featuring rhythmic patterning of arched openings and strong hierarchical organization with references features of the historic building and of other taller buildings, historic commercial buildings nearby without repl replicating them and will be harmonious with the architectural character of the landmark. That the materials and finishes of the tower and overall stru structure featuring precast concrete terrazzo with varying light gray mixtures at the street facing facades, gray brick at the lot line walls, and medium gray windows and storefronts throughout will clearly distinguish it from the historic building while being compatible with historic stone and cast iron elements of the landmark. And the work will not diminish the special architectural and historic character of the individual landmark, and the applicant will work with the staff to consider uh, a proper relationship with the adjacent uh, uh, a, a Thomas Street building uh, without any specific guidance as to what that relationship should be. <laughs> okay, and that, you know, that is because we have to understand <laughs> the property line and what's actually technically feasible. Okay. So, Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. Okay. All in favor? Or, Rich, will you call the vote? Second. Yes. <laughs> Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Nay. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Holford-Smith? Aye. Okay, with nine in favor and one opposed, the motion carries. It's approved and uh, please continue to work closely with the staff as you develop um, all of your final materials. Thank you so much. Karen and, Carroll? Yes? May I butt in and say, I think that was our last um, agenda item for the Annus Horribilis of 2020. <laughs> <laughs> but, but not because of anything that this commission has been doing. It's been spectacularly on target and doing our civic duty. And I hope the citizens of New York appreciate this minor little point as our city and our country and our world goes through such turmoil. Anyway, I just wanted to congratulate you, Sarah, particularly on running such a fine show this year. No, oh, thank it's you so much. Yeah, and that to the entire team as well, uh, yeah. the hardworking staff. Yeah, thank Agreed. you so much. And thank you yes. all for your you know, dedication and commitment and always being here and even being here this extra day. <laughs> I mean, it, it has made all of this possible and you know, the staff has been incredible and I really have to thank them for, for just stepping up, rising to the occasion and allowing us to continue to do our job. And it's, um, it's been an interesting year, but we've learned a lot and I think we can carry it forward with us. So thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Great all right. job. Thank you. Yeah. Happy, happy holidays. Happy, happy holidays. Happy holidays. Exactly. Happy holidays. Thank you all. Com Commissioner Brian, thank you for making that comment. I learned a new word today. <laughs> I think I got about 10 seconds, right? Not seconds, but seconding. Right. Good. Okay. Thank Bye -bye. you so much. Happy Take holidays, care. everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Bye -bye. Happy holidays. Bye. 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 Okay, so we're going to stop the recording.